It is the centennial of the Honda Point naval disaster, Saturday, September 8, 1923. There is no shortage of fantastic video documentaries and YouTube and other social media platforms about this event, as well as all kinds of online and print resources. In deference to those sources, we won't try to tell this story all over again. Suffice it to say that seven Clemson-class destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 11, the Delphi, S.P. Lee, Young, Woodbury, Nicholas, Fuller, and the Chauncey ran aground off the California coast while maneuvering at high speed in a dense fog, navigating by dead reckoning. This constitutes the single largest loss of ships in peacetime in the history of the U.S. Navy. Twenty-three sailors perished. Among the survivors was one Robert Ferguson, born and raised right here in Waterloo, a crew member of the S.P. Lee. Just eight days after the disaster, he sat down to write his mother a letter, an 18-page letter, detailing his experience. It is an abridged version of this letter that we will read right now. Written so soon after the disaster, it captures the drama, emotion, and heroism of the moment in a real, tangible sense. While you're listening, bear in mind the astonishing fact that Mr. Ferguson never learned to swim. The original letter resides in the Veterans Memorial Museum in Chehalis, Washington. Thanks to them for allowing us to record this video. San Diego, California, September 16th, 1923. Dearest Mother, Well, here I am, all fine and dandy after the reaction of a couple of days rest. I promised you I'd tell you all about our little wreck at Hondas. So far as I can remember, this is what I know what happened. I was in charge of the steaming watch. I had five men under me on watch at the main engines, one man at each throttle for each engine and screw, one man oiling in each engine room, one man at the evaporators making fresh water out of seawater for drinking and steaming uses, and myself, which made six men on watch in the engine rooms. I was up on deck getting a drink of water, and of course I could see the ship ahead of us and a little off to our right, which was the Delphi, when I noticed something which held me froze for a moment. The Delphi seemed to stand on end, and looked as if it were going up to the heavens. It was only a moment in happening. When I realized something was wrong, I went below to my men. I had reached the last four steps of the ladder when I was flung violently off my feet in a corner some few feet away. When I got to my feet, I heard a grating sound underneath, and then a crash. All was excited for a moment. When we realized what had happened, we went about our tasks as cool as if nothing had happened at all, but knowing we would be ordered out of there very soon. We had orders then to try backing, as we were going 20 knots at the time we struck. It took a short while to respond to the backing call. At that moment, things began to happen. The fire room, where the boilers are, called us and said their fuel oil tank had carried away. That meant the 7,000 gallon tank was bursted and oil running out, so we had to secure the fire to keep from having an explosion. We then tried to light off the other two boilers, and the oil tank there had bursted also. Then we laid heavily on our left side when an angry sea tossed us up. We settled heavily when a crash came in the forward engine room where I was. Looking around, I saw a huge rock sticking through the bottom of our ship. That rock looked like Gibraltar at that moment. Water began rushing in. I notified the bridge a rock had penetrated our hull and water was rushing in fast. By that time, it was to our knees. Waiting for word to abandon the engine room, we waited only a few minutes, but it seemed like hours. Water was to our chests when the word came. How much water is there in engine rooms? I told them and got orders to come to the top side, up on deck. I called the fire room, but no response came from them. I called frantically, but still no answer. Water was then almost up to my neck when I decided they were all out of the fire room, so then I came up the best way I could. I climbed over hot steam lines. The other men were up by then. Coming to the top side, I found that we were on some rocks about 30 feet from a larger rock, which would hold all of our men if we could get on it. We launched our life raft, and three other men and myself jumped in upon orders of our engineer officer. We had no oars or paddles, so we found a piece of timber floating by and got it and tried to reach the rock. The sea was running heavy. Men had to hold on to lifelines for their lives. If they let loose of the lines, the sea would have carried them away. After about 35 minutes of being washed against the rock and back to the ship, we secured a hold of the rock and jumped and hung on. The sea was coming over the ship, completely drenching all to the bone. We clambered up to a place where we could tie a rope to a snag of rock and told those on the ship to haul the raft back. 
and we would pull them over where we were. The order then came to abandon ship. We had all men off in a short time. When there were about 20 men over, I started to climb. I did not know where. I kept on going. The rock was a sheer, bare stone. Hardly no place to get a finger hold and dark and foggy. It was then about 10 o'clock. I had to be very careful in climbing for fear I would upset some rocks on the men below me. I arrived at the top all right and heard a train whistle. A lusty cheer went up from dozens of places around where we were, so we found out two things. First, more ships were on the rocks, and second, we were on the mainland. I half ran and stumbled to a light I saw. After a while, two men met me with lanterns. I took them and sent them for more, and then went back calling for the S.P. Lee gang. I got an answer and waited till all the men were up on high land, then went to where I heard men crying for help. I found a bunch of men from the Delphi, and they said a man was out of his head and could not be handled, so they tied him to a place to try and save his life as he wanted to jump into the sea. They asked where they were and where our men were. I told them, and told them the man I met with the lantern said there was a house about ten minutes walk away. I then went to where I saw another ship, and then I saw the saddest sight in my life. A sister ship, with men of whom I had known for years, had turned over on its side. I saw another ship then, further inland, that made four ships I know were wrecked. S.P. Lee, Delphi, Young, and the fourth, Chauncey. Stumbling down to where I could get as close as possible, I asked if they were all on board. They mistook me for an officer, for they answered, They were all on board and was helping the men of the Young aboard of her, the Chauncey, sir. Then they asked if they could land with life rafts, and I told them yes, and held the light to where I thought was the best place to land. A life raft came to where I was in the water. We tied a line to the rocks and sent the raft back. Then I showed the men how to get up the rocks to where I was told the house was. We then saw a huge fire that way, and knew our men had a fire to keep warm, and knew where to head for. I held the lantern at a dangerous place where the men had to cross, carrying their hurt buddies, till the chief with dry clothes took my place and told me to go and get dried. I went and laid down by the fire, but could not sleep. It was here where we realized just what had happened. We were literally flung upon the treacherous rocks that was hidden by the sullen blackness of the night. It was while warming ourselves about that fire when the reaction came. Strong men became as children, but only for a brief period. Our thoughts went to those men in the ships yet, and we prayed for daylight so we could go down and rescue them. We had heard more ships were on the rocks further out than we four were. Daylight came at about five o'clock. All was foggy yet. While awaiting daylight, I was able to send you a telegram by courtesy of a man who put up a line there at the place we found out was called Honda's, halfway between San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara. At daylight, we went to where the ships were on the rocks and saw three other ships, all men still perched at the highest places where the water could not reach them. We went out to our ship by the life raft and succeeded in getting a line to the Nicholas to the shore where the men of the S.P. Lee pulled them to the land, raft after raft load full. The last raft load capsized and broke loose, but the men were in shallow water and got safely to the land. Other men of other ships helped out the Woodbury and Fuller, who were further out and who had stayed all night on a large rock to the mainland. Then we tried to salvage what we could, but everything was full of water so we lost everything we owned except what we picked up laying around. Some men had only underwear on and climbed on rocks barefooted. I had on overalls which were soaked with oil, and it was oil from head to foot, and my hair is still full of it. The special train came Sunday evening at 5 o'clock. At Santa Barbara, we were met with a huge crowd who gave us sandwiches and coffee and smokes, the first since Saturday night. Three lusty cheers went to them. When we left at Los Angeles, no one was at the depot at San Diego Monday morning at 5 o'clock when we arrived. Wives and families met the train, smokes was given out to us by the Destroyer Force Club, but us men paid for them, as we pay for the upkeep of the club. San Diego did not do a thing for us, her boys who call San Diego home. The men were in the most pitiable condition. Strange the garments we wore, and even stranger the looks upon our faces. When a whistle blew, hundreds woke from a short sleep with a wild, starry look and expected to jump for their lives. Weary, cold, and wet, we came to the base where we were given a wiener sandwich and coffee. No milk or sugar. A wonderful reception when they had all day and night Sunday to prepare a meal for us. A few hours later, we were given beans, prunes, and coffee and bread. Then they told us to go to work, which we did not do. Now we work and smile. We have one suit of clothes, but that we will have to pay for. So, 
We just have to take the rubbing in and smile and show to the generations of servicemen to come how those who go down to the sea in ships can meet with disaster and still live on to be and smile and show them what we are and what we all want is to be real men. It was a terrible shock. I could not sleep till Tuesday night. Then I slept as in a coma. Now I'm all right, nervous yet, but all okay. The experience is worth lots to me, but I never want another such experience. We do not know when we get our clothes. I have lost around $400 of Navy and civilian clothes, suitcases, and other articles. We may be reimbursed and may not. It's all the game. So we have to suffer the loss and grin. What a lesson this would be to some of the people if they could only know how we do and pay and give our lives to the flag to protect their hearth and home and what do we get from the people we protect? A slur and slam and insults about the sailor is no good. Let them think so. I went through hell and saw heroes. Every sailor in that wreck was a hero and did heroic deeds to help save his buddies and think no more of it as if it were a common everyday occurrence. So mother, do not worry now, all is well. I'm alive and well and thankful. Love and kisses to all, your loving son, Bob.